talk about what I call the greatest uh, miracle of the 20th century. And uh, that is uh, the regathering of the Jewish people to their land. Uh, There's a story about a conversation about religion between Frederick II, who was king of Prussia, and uh, he asked a guy named Hans uh, Joachim von Zeiten, who was a, a cavalry general, uh, he, he was a, a Christian. That he was highly esteemed by uh, the king. And he, he said, give me proof for the truth of the Bible in two words. And, of course, uh, Zeitin replied, he said, your majesty, the Jews. And his uh, statement, of course, reflected his understanding of not only the miraculous preservation of the Jewish people, but his belief that their preservation was for bringing about uh, God's unfulfilled promises. And so for him, the present existence of the Jewish people was proof that God's word was true because Scripture had promised uh, that they would re- remain uh, until all had been prophesied concerning these uh, people was fulfilled. So remarkably, this uh, profession of faith, though, was made uh, at a time when Israel was desolate of any Jewish population and the majority of the Jews were still scattered uh, among the nations. I'm reminded of a similar statement by one of my favorite preachers from the past. Uh, J.C. Ryle uh, wrote this in 1867. Of course, he was the Bishop of Liverpool. He said this, this is 1867. He says, how shall we account for this extraordinary state of things? How shall we explain the unique and peculiar position which the Jewish people occupies in the world? Why is it, unlike Saxons and Danes and Normans and Flemings and French, this singular race still floats alone, though broken to pieces like a wreck on the waters of the globe amidst its uh, 1,500 million inhabitants? Of course, that's how many there were back in his day. He says, and after the lapse of 1,800 years is neither destroyed nor crushed nor evaporated nor amalgamated nor lost sight of, but lives to this day as separate and distinct as it was when the Arch of Titus was built in Rome. Rome. God has many witnesses to the truth of the Bible. If men would only examine them and listen to their evidence. But you may depend on it. There is no witness so unanswerable as one who always keeps standing up and living and moving before the eyes of mankind. That witness is the Jew. Now, Ryle was right. There's no witness more perplexing to the unbelieving skeptical world than uh, the miracle of the Jewish people. I experienced this firsthand not long ago. There was uh, a man in our church who's been good friends for a real long time with a, a professor over at UCO. And uh, the man is a chemistry professor there. And uh, so he had uh, read a a few of the things I'd written, was interested in prophecy, but he wanted to just get together and basically just talk about all kinds of different areas, you know, from creation to all kinds of stuff about the Bible. So we got together, and I mean, uh, scientifically, I mean, obviously he's out of my league. I'm scientifically, mathematically challenged in those areas. But we got together. What I find with a lot of people who are real intelligent like that, sometimes, though, the simplest things are the things that cause them to stumble the most. You know, they'll make all these long, you know, arguments about all these things and just, you know, kind of look at them and just say, well, but just look at all the complexity in the world. There's no way you could get all that, you know, with just enough time and enough uh, luck and chance and whatever. And they really don't have an answer for those kinds of simple statements. What I thought was interesting, we talked for about two hours, two and a half hours, about every topic you could possibly think of. You know, talking about prophecies in the Bible and the the manuscripts in the Bible. I mean, we talked about it from one end to the other. And what's often fascinating, if you've been in conversations with people, sometimes things will come up right at the very end, you know, that are the most profound that hit people. But we were talking, and almost as an afterthought, our conversation was about over. Because one of his main tenets, as we talked about all this, he kept saying, if there's a natural explanation for something, then you shouldn't look for a supernatural explanation of it. And I agreed with him on that. You know, anything that you can explain naturally, you shouldn't try to look for a, a supernatural. And, of course, he was trying to explain the miracles of Jesus naturally and all that, which really you can't do. But that, that, was, what he was, that was his thesis. But I just made a comment to him in passing at the end. I said, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about the, the miracle of the Jewish people. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, you know, God all the way back in Genesis 12 promised Abraham that his descendants would be like the sand on the seashore, that God would bless him, that he'd make his name great, uh, that God would give him a seed or descendants. He'd give his descendants that land and um, that, that, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. And I said, you know, it's interesting. The Jewish people have been scattered from their land time again. They've been hounded. They've been persecuting. I went through the different persecutions. And I said, why is it 
that this group of people has, there's been an age long hatred and persecution of this one group of people. You know, you can't say that about the Italians or the Russians or, you know, anybody. It's not true of anyone else. And I said, and they're back in their land today. And when the scriptures tell us that's going to be true, I mean, against all odds, their language had died completely. We're scattered all over the earth. And for the first time in all of our conversation we'd had, he had a very perplexed look on his face. And he said, you know, I really don't know that I can explain that naturally. There's no natural explanation for that. And I said, yeah, I mean, I said, you know, my explanation would be that it has to be supernatural. It's satanic. I mean, why is it this one group of people has just been hounded and hunted and persecuted throughout all of history? You know, people say, well, the Jews are hard to get along with or they're greedy or whatever. Well, there's a lot of people hard to get along with and greedy. I mean, you know, they're not the only ones. Everybody is really every group of people. So there wasn't a natural explanation. I thought that was um, fascinating to me because the one point he could not answer was the promise of God all the way back to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, that was later uh, amplified uh, by the prophets. He was not able to answer that. And I could tell, you know, being a man of science and, you know, this guy, I mean, he had answers for everything. It deeply bothered him, you know, that he wasn't able to come up with an answer for that, uh, that one issue. I was going to read a couple other quotes by some men you've probably heard of. I, I've got a, by the way, this is a great book. It's one of the best books I've read in the last five years, if you're interested in these things. It's by a guy named Barry Horner. I got to meet him last year. He's from Australia. He came down to our pre-trib meeting in Dallas. He's going to come this year and speak again to our meeting. But it's called Future Israel, uh, Why Christian Anti-Judaism Must Be Challenged. And what he calls today that's out there in a lot of uh, reformed circles, he doesn't call it anti-Semitism, but he calls it anti-Judaism. That's interesting because he's a, you know, he's a Calvinist, you know, a five-point Calvinist, and he's a big reformed guy. But he says if you're reformed and you believe in election, you have to believe in God's election of Israel and that he's going to fulfill those promises as well. In other words, it's not consistent to say, well, God has chosen us and elected us as the church, and so, you know, we're in and there's nothing we can do to get out of God's good graces. Our, we're eternally secure. And then turn around and say God elected Israel, but somehow Israel has done something uh, to forfeit their blessings. So he's showing the inconsistency of that viewpoint. But it's a, it is a great book. I mean, it's filled with all kinds of wonderful information. But he's got all kinds of quotes in here. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard of Horatius Boner, uh, 1808 to 1889. He was lived in Scotland. Um, he was friends with Robert Murray McShane, uh, a lot of the others there. And they were very favorably disposed to the Jewish people. But here's what he said at one point. He says, I am one of those who believe in Israel's restoration and conversion, who, re- who uh, receive it as a future certainty that all Israel shall be gathered and that all Israel shall be saved. As I believe in Israel's present degradation, so I do believe in Israel's coming glory and preeminence. And then on down further, he says, I believe that the sons of Abraham are to, re- are to re-inherit Palestine. I don't like that name for it, but that's what he called it. And that the forfeited fertility will yet return to that land, that the wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for them, and the desert will rejoice and blossom as the rose. And then uh, Charles Spurgeon, in, uh, in 1855, in one of his sermons at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, Spurgeon said this, But certainly if there is anything promised in the Bible, it is this. I imagine you cannot read the Bible without seeing clearly that there is to be an actual restoration of the children of Israel. And he goes on in a sermon in 1864, and he preached a sermon on Ezekiel 37, a passage we're going to look at a little bit later. He says, if there be meaning in words, this must be the meaning of this chapter. I wish never to learn the art of tearing God's meaning out of his own words. And I love that statement. He says, I don't want to ever learn the art of tearing God's meaning out of his own words. And that's what a lot of people are good at. He says, if there be anything clear and plain, the literal sense and meaning of this passage, talking about Ezekiel 37, a meaning not to be spirited or spiritualized away, must be evident that both the two and the ten tribes of Israel are to be restored to their own land and that ultimately a king uh, is to rule over them. Now, I could go on and on. He's got all kinds of quotes in here uh, by you know, men from the, 18th, from the uh, 19th century. And, of course, actually, we could go all the way back uh, to the 2nd century, the 3rd century of, of uh, church history, 
And uh, men like Irenaeus believed the Jewish people were going to ultimately be be regathered to their land. So to me, this is one of those promises that that people, when it looked insurmountable, like an insurmountable obstacle, they uh, believed in it. So the preservation of the Jews as a distinct people for almost 2,000 years and the modern regathering uh, to their ancient homeland, to me, is an undeniable confirmation of the truthfulness of the Bible. Uh, Dr. Randall Price, I quoted him last week, a, a good friend of mine. He highlights the modern miracle of the Jewish people. Listen to this statement. He says, The modern return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel has been called the miracle on the Mediterranean. Such a return by a people group that had been scattered among the nations is unprecedented in history. Indeed, the Jewish people are the only exiled people to remain a distinct people despite being dispersed to more than 70 countries for more than 20 centuries. The mighty empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome all ravaged their land, took their people captive, and scattered them throughout the earth. Even after this, they suffered persecution, pogrom, and holocaust in the lands to which they were exiled. Yet all of these ancient kingdoms have turned to dust, and their former glories remain only as museum relics. And many of the nations that oppose the Jews have suffered economic, political, or religious decline. But the Jewish people whom they enslaved and tried to eradicate live free and have begun, uh, again become a strong nation. A lot of you are familiar with, uh, you know, Mark Twain. Um, he visited uh, the land of Israel in the late uh, 1800s. And uh, he, he wrote about uh, them. And, of course, he was an agnostic. But let me just read a couple things that uh, Twain says about this. He says, The Egyptian, Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and Roman followed, made a vast noise, and they're gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jews saw them all beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Now think about that. Twain didn't have an answer because uh, he was not a believer. He didn't understand it. But not only have the Jewish people survived as a distinct people down through the centuries against staggering odds, but they've been restored to their homeland and revived their dead language. Uh, Again, listen to this statement. It says the fact of the Jewish people's continuity is more remarkable in light of the testimony of history of exile and return in all of human history. There have been less than 10 deportations of a people group from their native land. That's interesting. In all of history that we know of, there have been about ten deportations of people from their native land. These people groups disappeared in history because they assimilated into the nations to which they were exiled. However, the Jewish people did not simply experience a single exile, but multiple exiles. The contrast here with other historical exiles should not be overlooked. While other people groups were exiled to one country, the Jews were dispersed to many different countries and, in fact, were scattered to every part of the earth. The Jewish people also hold the distinction of being the only people to have successfully revived their ancient tongue after more than 2,000 years. In the late 19th century, when Jews began immigration to the land, Jews only spoke the language of the countries from which they'd returned. One man, Eleazar ben Yehuda, Uh, decided the proper tongue of the Jewish people who were now back in the land was the language of the prophets. He began teaching the children, and today Hebrew is spoken daily by every man, woman, and child in Israel. By contrast, what country or people group today uh, speak uh, Egyptian? And he's talking about ancient Egyptian, you know, hieroglyphics, Assyrian or Latin. Only the Jewish people have successfully regained the use of their original language in everyday life. Moreover, the Jewish people are the only people to have returned en masse to their ancient homeland and have restored their national independence by reestablishing their former state. Any one of these facts of Israel's survival would be remarkable, but taken together, uh, they are miraculous. So just as the Bible predicted in the prophets, you know, 2,500 years ago, the Jewish people are being restored to their land from all over the earth. And the Bible-believing Christians down through the centuries anticipated this uh, and awaited this. When I was uh, attending Dallas Seminary, 
Um, I was privileged to have uh, several courses with Dr. Pentecost, J. Dwight Pentecost. Uh, Dr. Pentecost, I, he, last uh, April, he turned either 95 or 96, and he still teaches three classes a week. And, uh, I mean, the guy, you know, he's like the Energizer Bunny, man. He just keeps going. You know, it's amazing having him there. But I remember in one of the classes I had, Dr. Pentecost told the story of when he was a young man, I uh, lived in Pennsylvania at the time. He was a pastor at a church, and he'd been speaking at uh, a retreat. And he was driving back in his car. And, of course, those of you that were alive at that time remember, you know, well, I wasn't here, but you can remember the old radios, you know, back then, crackling and your car. And he was driving, and he said he was driving home. It was late at night, and they came over the radio. It was May the 14th of 1948. And they came over the radio and they said that the Jewish state had been established and had been recognized by uh, President Harry Truman. And Dr. Pentecost, of course, even then, as a student of Bible prophecy, he said he had to pull off the side of the road. He couldn't drive any longer. Just tears coming down his face. I mean, because uh, a promise that people had believed and anticipated, men we talk like Ryle and, and Spurgeon and all of them, that had been anticipated for all this time uh, had come to pass. And uh, they rose... I'm up out of the ashes of the Holocaust. And I don't have time to go into this, but if you go back and look historically in the 1940s, it's, it's believed by almost everybody that I've been able to read that Roosevelt would not have recognized uh, the, the state of Israel. Um, he, he would not have done that. He had people around him. In fact, Truman had advisors around him telling him not to do it either. But what's fascinating is uh, Harry Truman, he, he, was, he was known by some people as the Cussin Baptist from Missouri. You know, he, was a, he was a Baptist. Uh, I'm not saying he's the greatest of Baptists. I don't know whether Harry Truman was saved or not. But, but Harry Truman grew up in Baptist churches, and he's talked about how when he was growing up, he remembers in those churches, he remember his mother reading the Bible to him, reading the Old Testament, and how much of the, the Old Testament is about, it's about Israel. And so while he probably didn't understand a lot of it, certainly didn't understand these prophecies, God had at that time a president of the United States who knew enough about the Bible to know that Israel was important, that this was a part of God's word. And so he recognized uh, the nation of Israel. I think it was, you know, 14 minutes after 11 minutes or something like that after uh, Ben-Gurion had uh, announced their their. Uh, the formation of the, of the state of Israel. Of course, someone you know, later said, what took him so long? You know, he did like 11 minutes or whatever. But, you know, an unbelievable event in, uh, in history. You know, even if someone's not a believer, uh, these promises that people had waited for for hundreds of years came to fruition. Now, I read something not long ago I was going to read to you here that really, uh, this is probably one of the most interesting things I've read in a long time. Not only have Christian leaders recognized the unique place Israel holds in God's plan of the ages, but even the most virulent anti-Semite um, who, who's lived in you know, the several centuries spent time contemplating the destiny of the Jews. I'm talking about uh, Hitler. In his book, Mein Kampf, I ran across this not long ago, and I looked, at it, looked this up in Mein Kampf, an English translation of it myself, to make sure it's really there. Because, you know, on the Internet you'll read, you know, people say somebody said this or whatever. But I looked up in a copy of it. This is what Hitler said in his book, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. He said, in hardly any people in the world is the instinct of self-preservation developed more strongly than in the so-called chosen of this, the mere fact of the survival of this race may be considered the best proof. Where is the people which in the last 2,000 years have been exposed to so slight changes of inner disposition, character, etc., as the Jewish people? What people finally has gone through greater upheavals than this one and nevertheless issued from the mightiest catastrophes of mankind unchanged? What an infinitely tough will to live and preserve the species speaks to these facts. I'm calling them the species, you know, it's going back to his Darwinian uh, viewpoints. But Hitler even entertained the notion that the preservation of the Jewish people was a sign of some mysterious hand of destiny or even possibly divine favor. Listen to what he wrote. I mean, this, these are chilling words. He says this about himself. He says, from a weak cosmopolitan, I had become a fanatical anti-Semite. Just one more time, it was the last I was visited by the deepest anxiety and oppressive thoughts. 
As I scrutinized the effects of the Jewish people over long periods of human history, suddenly there arose the fearful question, did an unknowable destiny for reasons unbeknownst to us poor men perhaps wish with eternal and immutable decision that the final victory go to this little nation? And you notice what he said. He says, I've become a virulent anti-Semite. But he says, these thoughts arose in me for one last time. It's like he, he finally put them down. Then he said this, could it be that this people, which lives only for the earth, will be granted it as a reward? Could it be these people that live only for the earth that they're going to be granted this earth as a reward? As I calmly and clearly deepened my knowledge of Marxism and thus the effects of the Jewish people, destiny itself gave me uh, the answer. So he turned away from it. But there was a time in his life and fear, he talks that the deepest anxiety and oppressive thoughts came into his mind. Is there some, uh, notice the words he used, unknowable destiny. Um, some eternal, immutable decision um, that they will be granted uh, this reward. But the mastermind of the final solution knew in the deepest recesses of his heart that they had an immutable, eternal destiny. And their survival of his attempt to exterminate them and their rise to a nation proved ultimately that his contemplations were correct. Uh, the original contemplations that he had. Well, I want to look at some different scriptures now for us because I think that one of the most prophesied events in the Bible is a regathering of the Jewish people. Now, let me say something that's very important here, and, and some of you who know more about prophecy will grasp this maybe a little bit more quickly. I don't want to confuse the issue, but I need to say this. I believe there are going to be two future regatherings. There, there are two future regatherings or end-time regatherings of the Jewish people. The first one is the one that we see happening now. It's a regathering that I believe the Bible tells us will be a regathering in unbelief. The Jewish people, I think the Bible tells us, are going to be regathered the first time in unbelief to their land in preparation for the coming tribulation period. Obviously, they're going to be regathered in unbelief because if they were in belief, then there wouldn't be a need for the tribulation, right? So they're going to be regathered in unbelief, which is what we see happening. The vast majority of Jews coming to their land don't believe in their Messiah. So they're going to be regathered in unbelief for in preparation for the tribulation period. But then during the tribulation, as they're persecuted by Antichrist, they're going to be scattered again, many of them. And so then at the end of the tribulation, God is going to regather them a second time from all over the world, and that's going to be the final regathering when He regathers them then not for the tribulation but for the millennium. Um, they're going to be regathered then in belief, if you will, after they've come to faith in their Messiah. So there are two regatherings. That's why in some places in the Old Testament, you know, it speaks of their regathering and the Messiah ruling and reigning over them and so on. That's that ultimate final regathering. But there's going to be a regathering first in unbelief. That's the one that uh, we're witnessing now. But let me just read a few scriptures. If you want to turn there with me, turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. I mean, there are all kinds of places in the Old Testament I think we read about a regathering of the Jewish people. Now, the problem is some people, when they read about these regatherings, they will say, well, when Jeremiah is writing about this regathering, he's writing about their regathering after their 70 year Babylonian captivity. But in the context of most of these passages, I'm going to read the, the what said there did not happen when they came back out of the Babylonian exile. And so. I think since those things weren't fulfilled, it looks to uh, another regathering, the one that we've uh, begun to see in our own time. Notice in Jeremiah uh, verse, uh, chapter 30, verse 1, The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write all the words which I've spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming. And that's a common prophetic you know, statement about future times. Days are coming declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Now these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror. 
of dread and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? Why have all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's distress or the time of Jacob's trouble. But he will be saved from it. Now, you'll notice here in verses 1 to 3, he says, I'm going to regather the people to the land. But when they're regathered, what are they regathered for? A time of trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble, it's, uh, it's a, another synonym or a term, I would say, for the tribulation period. So they're being going to be regathered. I'm going to restore their fortunes and bring them back. But then he says it's going to be a time of, of trouble. I mean, you know, it's, I mean it, he says, you know, it's, it, it's so bad that I see every man bent over. You know, he says, can a man give birth? You know, they're bent over like they're in childbirth. And, of course, this speaks of the birth pangs uh, that Jesus spoke of as well over in, in Matthew chapter 24. So you see what we have here is a regathering of the Jewish people in the end times in preparation for, for discipline, for judgment. Now, there's other places where we see a regathering for their blessing, and that's going to be that final uh, worldwide regathering. Uh, go to, over to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 34 and uh, verse 11. It says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he uh, is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and all the inhabited places of the earth. I'll feed them in a good pasture. Their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. They will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in the rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I'll feed my flock and lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I'll seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I'll feed them with judgment. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'll judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Is it too slight a thing for you that you should feed in good pasture? That you must tread down on your feet the rest of your pastures. That you should drink of the clear waters. You must uh, foul the rest with your feet. As for my flock, they must eat what you tread down with your feet and drink what you foul with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, even I will judge between the fat sheep and the lean. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust all the weak to your horns until you've uh, scattered them abroad. Therefore, I deliver my flock and they will no longer be a prey. I'll judge between one sheep and the other. Then he goes to talk about how David's going to rule over them. So this is that ultimate regathering that God's going to bring about uh, to bless uh, the Jewish people. But, But think about this for a moment. All of the all of the end time prophecies, well, not all of them, but almost all or a great majority of old of end time prophecies hinge in one way or another on the Jewish people being a nation. I mean, for instance, the the prophecy that the event that starts the seven year tribulation is a covenant between the Antichrist and Israel, that coming prince in Israel, according to Daniel 927. Well, if Antichrist, the event that starts the seven year tribulation is a covenant between Antichrist and Israel, then what does that mean? Well, Israel has to exist. They have to be regathered. Um, You know, Ezekiel 38 and 39 speaks of this invasion, you know, the Gog Magog invasion of these nations that come down into Israel. Um, They're going to come down to the mountains of Israel. Well, I mean, in order for Israel to be invaded in the end times, Israel has to exist. So. We can see how many prophecies in the scriptures are are uh, contingent upon the fact of Israel being a nation. So to me, it's it's one of the great prophecies in all of scripture. And really, it's been called by many correctly, the super sign of the end times, because almost every other prophecy hinges in one way or another on Israel being a nation. And the fact that they're back in their land now I mean, so uh, biblically significant to us. Now, in it, look over to Ezekiel 37. This is uh, uh, the, one of the key passages. And my, one of my great pet peeves in life is to see somebody come to Ezekiel 37 and spiritualize this passage. Um, notice what it says. This is the great vision of the valley of dry bones. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. Well, that's a great statement, isn't it? I mean, the prophet Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley was full of bones 
He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter that you may come to life. I'll put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked and behold, sinews were on them and flesh grew and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. A lot of people, you know, they come and say, this is the picture of a lost person, you know, coming back to life, or it's a picture of physical resurrection or whatever. Well, all you got to do is just keep reading. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. It's not a lost sinner, you know, getting saved or whatever. It's Israel. Our, because they say our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord and I've opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. And it's not talking here, I don't believe, about spirit, about physical resurrection. It's talking about the resurrection of the nation because it's the whole house of Israel. As we go down and read, he says, I'll put my spirit within you and you'll come to life and I will place you on your own land. It's talking about bringing them back physically. Then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, Son of man, take for yourself one stick and ride on it for Judah. For the sons of Israel, his companions, take another stick and ride on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel. For join them for yourself, one another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. So it's picturing the nation coming back together again. When the sons of your people speak to you saying, "Will, will you not declare to us what you mean? Uh, by these things. Now, what I see in this is the valley of the dry bones. It symbolizes the nation of the Israel of Israel coming back together in the end times. He sees this valley of dry bones that illustrates the national return and then the restoration and the regeneration of Israel. But notice Israel is first restored to the land physically. Then they're restored or regenerated or brought to the Lord spiritually. The first step is physically being brought to the land. The second step is breath coming into them, being restored spiritually uh, to the Lord. And you'll notice here, it happens in stages. It's bone to bone. And then there's sinew. And then there's skin. And what it pictures here is them coming back uh, in stages as the nation is being regathered uh, back into their land. So the process of physical regathering to the land of Israel has been going on now for about 130 years. It's been a long process. And it will ultimately result in the physical, the spiritual restoration or regeneration of the people of Israel. Uh, The modern beginning of the return to Israel began back in 1871. A few Jews began to trickle back into the land. By 1881... 25,000 Jews lived in Israel. Um, At the first Zionist Congress in 1897, many of you know the name of Theodore Herzl. The first Zionist Congress was in 1897. And the goal of reclaiming the the land for the Jewish people was officially adopted. And during those years, the regathering was slow. By 1914, 80,000 Jews lived back in the land of Israel. Uh, During World War I, uh, Britain sought support for, from uh, the Jews for the war effort. And a lot of you are familiar with the Balfour Declaration. Um, Balfour, Arthur Balfour, issued uh, the Balfour Declaration. It was actually a letter that he wrote to Lord Rothschild, who was a well-known uh, Jew. And in that, uh, Balfour, who was the British Foreign Secretary, said this. He said, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The problem was, you know, like in all politics, the the British 
also wanted to have friendly relations for the Arabs. So nothing was really done much with this. But, but by 1939, though, when World War II broke out, 450,000 Jews lived in Israel. A lot of people aren't aware of that. There were 450,000 Jews in Israel in 1939. So you can see how it's just a, a slow process of them coming back. And, of course, we all know uh, what happened with World War II, with the atrocities that took place. And from that, uh, the new nation was spawned in, on May 14, 1948. And the new nation was given 5,000 square miles of territory. And 650,000 Jews and several uh, 100,000 Arabs lived there uh, in that land. Let me just... Uh, give a a brief timeline kind of from 1948 of some important events. Most of you know about these. In fact, a lot of them have happened in our lifetime. But in 1948, the state of Israel declared its independence, and it was immediately attacked by five Arab nations. Most of us know about that. 1949, Jerusalem was divided into two parts, the new city under Jewish rule, the old city under Jordanian rule. 1956, Israel, Great Britain, and France captured the Sinai from Egypt. In 1964, the PLO uh, was established. In in uh, June 6th to 11th, 1967, the Six-Day War, Israel defeated Egypt, Syria, and Jordan and got all of Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, uh, the Jordan, and the Gaza Strip. Every time the enemy attacked Israel, Israel ended up with more land. 1973, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack against Israel. Uh, but Israel uh, turned them back. And that's an uh, amazing thing. If you've ever been to Israel and you go up into the Golan Heights and, of course, you look over into the, the area to the north there, the, the Valley of Tears, that's where the, the, the Syrians, you know, of course, came uh, up into the Golan Heights area to, to wipe them out. And it was Day of Atonement. Everybody was worshiping. You know, people were in their uh, synagogues. And just a few tanks, a few people were up there. Uh, you know, you guides can tell you all about it. But, I mean, it's the, the Jewish uh, uh, tanks started firing. They fired so many rounds in succession that their barrels melted. And they weren't able to shoot anymore. I mean, they were under such attack. But uh, what they were able to do, the Syrians were coming through in this long, narrow area. And at least the Jews hit a couple of the tanks in the front. And they hit a few of them in the back where they couldn't get out of there. And were able to, to shoot at them. And, I mean, it was uh, amazing. What ended up happening is... They were trying to rally the people to let them know what was happening. And so they sent a couple of jet fighters real low, like over Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet off the ground, basically. I mean, just shook everything. So people kind of running outside thinking, what in the world's going on? And then they start listening to their radios and uh, would find out. But we were on our last trip to Israel. Uh, our guide had to leave for one day, our guide Amir, because uh, he was having some, his uh, children were, were ill. So we had, we had another guy named Avi. Who came and Avi had been uh, in the in the '67 and the '73 war, and he talked. He told us all about because he was with a group that uh, that was defending the city on the north side as the, as uh, they were being just you know just an onslaught against them. And uh, he was telling us stories about. It. And you could see when he was telling the stories, man, his eyes just kind of almost got on fire. You know, as he was telling us about it. And you know, they just had these bunch of na- kind of what we'd call national guard kind of guys. You know, got up on this ridge, and there's all kinds of memorials to them there and what they did. But um, we asked him. We said, you know, how were you able to hold them off like that? And man, he just gritted his teeth. I'll never forget the look on his face. He says, "We fought like the devil." <laughs> I mean, he was, and he was like reliving this whole thing, you know. But. It's uh, amazing to go over there and, and hear the stories about these things. 1979, uh, Israel and Egypt signed the Camp David Accords. Israel gave back the Sinai Peninsula, remember, to Egypt in exchange for peace. 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, um, Operation Peace of Galilee. It was uh, the, the Lebanon War began. Um, 1987 to 1993 was the first Intifada. The word Intifada means uprising in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, during the first Gulf War, Israel was hit by Scud, Iraqi Scud missiles. Uh, the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993. Israel Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser, Yasser Arafat shook hands at the White House. 2000, Israel withdrew from Lebanon. And right after that, the second intifada erupted in September when Ariel Sharon visited the Temple Mount. It's always interesting. You're always telling Israel, if you'll do this and we'll give you peace. But every time Israel withdraws, it's, they withdraw and then there's an intifada. Uh, the U.S. presents the roadmap for peace in the Middle East in 2003. 
In 2005, Israel pulled out of all 21 settlements in Gaza, and the next year they fought a bloody 30-day, four-day war with Hezbollah and uh, with Hamas. You know, after they pulled out of all those settlements in Gaza, then all of that came about. But, you know, on and on we could go reading about their history, but most of us have seen this. It's in the news uh, every day. One of the things, something I read years ago that uh, has kind of had a lasting impact on me. I, I'd remembered it this last week. A lot of you have heard of R.C. Sproul. Now, R.C. Sproul, a well-known theologian. I have tremendous respect uh, for Dr. Sproul. But uh, Dr. Sproul is an amillennialist, and he really, you know, he doesn't believe in a distinction between Israel and the church. But he's got a book on Romans, and I read this a long time ago. And this is, in a, this is a long footnote that he has in, in his uh, section on Romans 11. Of course, you know, Romans 11 speaks of the the ultimate uh, what I would say, the ultimate uh, regathering and God's ultimate final dealings with the Jewish people. Listen to what Sproul says here, though, in this footnote about from Romans 11. He says, I don't know whether this restoration he's talking about the one in Romans 11 is going to be sudden or gradual or if it's going to follow the return of the Jews to their own land. There's still a quite a bit of debate about that. I remember sitting on my porch in Boston in 1967, watching on television the Jewish soldiers soldiers coming into Jerusalem, dropping their weapons and rushing to the Wailing Wall and weeping and weeping. Immediately I telephoned one of my dear friends, a professor of Old Testament theology, who does not believe that modern day Israel has any significance whatsoever. And I asked him, what do you think now? From A.D. 70 to 1967, almost 1,900 years, Jerusalem has been under the domination and control of Gentiles. And now the Jews have recaptured the city of Jerusalem. Jesus said that Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What's the significance of that? He replied, I'm going to have to rethink this situation. (laughs) What an understatement. And then Sproul says it was indeed startling. Well, he says 1967 was many years ago. and We've not seen the restoration of the Jewish nation, although we've seen the greatest concentration on eschatology the church has ever known. There have been periods before in church history and people for one reason or another were excited about the nearness of the return of the Jews and were disappointed to find out that it was not as close at hand as they thought. Perhaps it will be another thousand years before the Jews have complete control of Jerusalem. Uh, present... Uh, Arrangements are just temporary interlude. Then he goes on to to say, I don't know what the significance of all this is, but I tell you this, we should be watching very carefully. It is a remarkable event in history that the city of Jerusalem is now back in Jewish hands under Jewish control. So a lot of guys like this that don't hold the view that we hold, they're perplexed by this. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, a few years ago, my friend Tommy Ice debated a guy named Greg Beal down at uh, OCU. And Greg Beal's an amillennial. Tommy's premillennial. And there's a, a good debate and all. But Greg Beal went to Dallas Seminary where I went, you know, and he was taught premillennialism, dispensationalism, and then you know, he doesn't hold that view anymore. But I went up to talk to him afterwards. And I always be nice. I've been in things like that, and people come up afterwards and jumping on you. Know, I was trying to be as gracious as I could. I just asked him, I said, Dr. Beal, I said, I'd like to ask you a question. I said, do you see any significance, you know, from your viewpoint to the modern, to the regathering of the state of Israel? And uh, he said, well, and he kind of was hum on around. He said, well, and he said, well, frankly, no, no, I really don't. And I said, well, do you ever find it interesting? No, I mean, you just wonder, I mean, why is it, you know, that why are they back there? He said, well, yeah, uh, every once in a while, I do think about that. I really, you know, I do. That's all I ask him. But I just thought, you know, how can someone not uh, see that? Again, just reading the things I've read. I mean, you know, even uh, people like Hitler and agnostics, you know, like Mark Twain and others, you know, they say, what is the the secret, uh, you know, to these people? And here you have people who love the Lord, who know the Lord, who read the Bible. And I actually had a man tell me one time, an amillennial guy that I was talking to, he said, I don't think Israel today is any more significant than Uruguay or Paraguay or France. I said, well, Uruguay and Paraguay and France aren't mentioned 2,500 times in the Bible, you know. I mean, um, you know, statements like that that people like, there's no significance, uh, you know, to that. Well, I mean, but men like Sproul, I mean, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, as they certainly do in God's providence, then obviously God has brought them back there for a purpose. And I think only by reading the Scriptures and taking them literally, these Old Testament prophecies, does it, 
uh, really have meaning. I read a quote not long ago in the paper. It says this, the data indicates the closure of historical circle. For the first time since the destruction of the second temple at 70 AD, Israel has once again become the largest concentration of Jews in the world. That happened in, uh, in, in uh, 2009. The first time since the destruction of the Jewish temple, there are now more Jews in Israel than any other place on earth because there are uh, 5.2 million Jews now in the U.S. and there are 5.4 million Jews in Israel. So the number of Jews in Israel has now officially surpassed for the first time since the destruction of the second temple. Think about this. In 1948, only 6% of the Jews in the world lived in Israel. Today it's almost 40%. And it's expected by the year 20, in the 2020s sometime to be uh, at around 50% of the Jews in the world uh, to be back in the land of Israel. I thought it was interesting. I, I was uh, at a conference the other day and I heard a guy read a quote from Robert Kennedy. Of course, you know, his father, Joe Kennedy, was an anti-Semite. Robert Kennedy said this uh, back in the 60s. He says, it's against, all, it's against all law and nature that the Jewish state should exist. And people who don't even have an explanation for it, they still understand it's against all uh, law and nature. And that's why, again, when we see today in, in the uh, press, in the media, why is it, again, that all the world seems to be turned against Israel? Why does everybody, I mean, it's this little piece of land, you know, the size of New Jersey. You know, 5.4 million Jews live there. Why, is, why are they in the paper every day? Why does all the world hate them? The only two nations that have consistently voted for Israel in the United Nations are the United States and Micronesia. Now, those are the only two. And I don't know why Micronesia does, but anyway, they do. But the rest of the world consistently has turned against them. And again, going back to my discussion with the, the chemistry professor, the only explanation for that is a supernatural explanation. Because you see Satan, when God promised that it was through Abraham and his descendants that the Messiah would come, we know from the Old Testament, Satan did everything he could to wipe out the Jewish people. And he took them down to Egypt with Pharaoh, uh, with Haman in the book of, uh, of Esther, with Antiochus Epiphanes. I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but every time someone tries to wipe out the Jews, they always end up with a holiday. Have you ever noticed that? With Pharaoh, you know, tries to wipe them out, they get Passover. With uh, Haman in the book of Esther, they got the Feast of Purim. With Antiochus Epiphanes, they get the Feast of Lights or Hanukkah. And even with, with Hitler in World War II, what do they get? May the 14th, 1948, uh, the rebirth of their nation. So, but you see this throughout history. But when it was prophesied Messiah would come, Satan did everything he could to cut off the line and somehow must stop Messiah from coming. But now that Messiah has come, he's died on the cross, he's been raised from the dead, what I say now is Satan's gone to plan B, and plan B is to wipe out the people that the Bible has promised that Messiah will come back to rule over. Because if he can wipe out the Jewish people, then he can thwart the promise of God that Jesus is going to come back as David's son and sit on David's throne and rule over uh, David's kingdom. And we see that played all the way out to the book of Revelation, to Revelation chapter 12. Remember Satan, when we looked at that passage, Satan's take, persecuting the woman there that's the picture of Israel, chasing her into the wilderness. So that's the only explanation uh, for what we see. Every, uh, every foreign visitor who comes to the land of Israel by plane, if you've been there, you, you come the same way. You have to go through passport control there at Ben-Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. And after you pass through there on your way, you're greeted by a huge uh, colorful tapestry uh, that welcomes you to the land. And millions of people come and go, of course, through that airport, but most probably notice a sign. There's a sign there that depicts masses of people. Uh, streaming into the gates of the city of Jerusalem. And on that tapestry in Hebrew, there's a, a, a prophetic text from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31:17, And it says, uh, so it translated into English, it says, so there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. And whether or not the incoming Jewish people can read those words yet, because a lot of them come in there, don't speak Hebrew yet. Now, the lesson is understood for their coming home, I believe, as part of God's plan to regather his people for the fulfillment of his ancient promises. And so this regathering of Israel is the number one sign of the end times, I believe, but it's also the greatest miracle um, of the 20th century, the regathering of the Jewish people to their homeland uh, from worldwide exile. And we are witnessing 
what other generations of Christians, I mean, since 70 A.D., people who took the Bible literally and understood these promises literally, we are the generation that these are getting to witness what these former generations just dreamed of. Again, these, all these men I, I read from at the beginning. And this points to, I think, the fulfillment of other uh, key end-time prophecies uh, as well. Uh, Israel is the fuse for the powder keg, if you will, for all of these end-time events. And for the first time in history, uh, that's moving into place. And, you know, as I see this, to me, this and other signposts are kind of all lining up. And as we see those things, things happening, it, it indicates us, to us that the, the coming of the Lord could be very near. And uh, we need to, in these days in which we live, uh, be praying uh, for, for the Jewish people. I'll be praying for um, Jerusalem, the peace of Jerusalem, as the Bible tells us to do. In fact, you know, I, I think every day as uh, believers, you know, we ought to be praying for our own country. Uh, we ought to be praying for missions around the world and the salvation of people. But I think we ought to be praying for Israel as well. God has called upon us to do that. They're His chosen people. I, I love that passage in, uh, in Romans 11 where it says, uh, They're elect for the Father's sake. But they're enemies for the sake of the gospel. You think about that. Today, the Jewish people, the majority of them, have not accepted their Messiah. So Paul says there in Romans 11, when it comes to the gospel, they're enemies of the gospel. And where did Paul, where did most of his problems come from? The Jews, right? But he says, yet for the sake of the fathers, they're elect. And uh, in his book, in this book, uh, Future Israel, uh, Barry Horner says that what we see with the Jewish people today is an oxymoron. They're elect enemies of God. But God is going to ultimately uh, bring them to Himself in mass, according to passages like Zechariah chapter 12. He's regathering them there uh, for these great events to take place. But in these uncertain times in which we live, difficult days, a lot of anxiety out there, a lot of fear, to me, we have our generation, we have the opportunity to see one of the greatest prophecies in all of history coming uh, to fruition right before our very eyes. And that ought to give us a lot of comfort and give us a lot of peace that God is going to keep his word to us, the promises he made to us, because of all the rebellion of the Jewish people, God's still keeping his word to them. So it ought to give us comfort for our own lives when we turn away from God and we're not what we should be. But it also ought to give us uh, great comfort in, as well in the sovereignty of God to bring His ultimate plan and, and goals uh, to pass. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer.